Um, I'm sorry, um, you all didn't get a chance to chime in, but uh, I'm sure you, you would have if, uh, if we'd had more time. So um, welcome everybody who's here for the January meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. We've been meeting virtually since uh, pretty early in the last year for the uh, obvious reasons of the pandemic. We appreciate everybody's time uh, once a month to get together to talk about things we all do agree on, which is that space and astronomy and science is awesome. Uh, so uh, for this month's break uh, from uh, other events, uh, we're going to have uh, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, uh, who, will, uh, who will introduce uh, later. Uh, also, John Pinto is going to talk about the Algol uh, Minima. Uh, Derek will do our normal Astro Photo Showcase, and then at the end, I will spend just a minute uh, on the moon. So the, just a reminder, the official CFIS Communications Group is through Groups IO, uh, and if you're interested in joining, uh, www.cephas.org is the place to go. Uh, you can join through PayPal uh, that way. If you're not a member of Groups IO, you can go here. Uh, this comes up every month, uh, and, uh, and subscribe to our, our news group. A reminder, Sharife is still looking for astrophotos to use in our social media efforts. Send them to uh, her at this email listed, uh, S-G-A-C-E-L at gmail.com. Also, Lynn asked me to mention, if you do any kind of outreach or sharing, let Lynn Ward know. He likes to register these with the NASA Night Sky Network. Uh, I didn't realize I set up out in the, in the driveway for the conjunction and I did a video chat with my, uh, with my friends from work and then a whole bunch of neighbors came and by golly, that was an outreach event. Uh, so let Lynn know about that so that we can get that uh, recorded. We do have one virtual star party coming up this month, uh, hosted by uh, Mark Gillette and, and uh, Lynn Ward. Lynn, interrupt me if you need to say anything about it, but I think uh, you can watch on Groups.io or the Facebook page for announcements. And with all that blather out of the way, I'm going to let Frank Kane introduce our speaker and we can get the main show on the road. Woohoo, all right. So tonight's speaker is Dr. Phil Plate, AKA the bad astronomer. Phil worked on the Hubble Space Telescope team in the 90s, and today he's a popular science communicator. If you've ever turned on the Science Channel or Discovery, you've probably seen his talking head on how the universe works and a bunch of other astronomy shows. He was a lead science writer for Bill Nye Saves the World on Netflix, and he wrote and hosted the Crash Course Astronomy series on YouTube. If books are your thing, Phil's the author of Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies, and he also writes the Bad Astronomy blog on SciFi.com, and there's more. He has a great newsletter on Substack you can subscribe to as well, and I'll post links to all that stuff in the chat. But most importantly, he's a fellow Star Trek fan, and I think that'll be apparent in the title of his talk tonight, Strange New Worlds. It's my honor to welcome Phil Plate. Thank you. Howdy. Can you all hear, see me and hear me? Yes. Just to make sense. Uh, yeah. Just to make sure. Uh, yeah, I've got, a, got my own phaser here. That's just in case somebody asks me a question from the audience that I, uh, I don't care for. So just to have a care there, okay? Um, thank you for that, that lovely introduction. Uh, every time I hear somebody say all that stuff, it's like, wow, I've been around a long time. I don't work all that hard, but you know, if you do it for 20, 30 years, uh, it adds up. Um, I am uh, very pleased to be here, uh, giving you all a talk. Um, I don't know, Central Florida, um, it's, I'm, I'm looking out my window here and we've got clear skies. I don't know what Central Florida is like, except I, I assume it's humid. Uh, that's something we don't deal with here much. Um, on the other hand, uh, observing here is, is it's cold, and I don't I don't expect you guys get as cold as we do in the winter. So um, that that virtual star party sounds fun, and I have to say these virtual star parties are excellent. I love um, being able to sit around in my PJs and watch other people do all the work, but then reap the benefit myself by being able to see all these terrific objects. So it's really really awesome. So I'm glad you all are doing this. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk tonight. Um, I get to talk about one of my favorite things, and I was going to say in the whole world, and that's, that's a silly thing to say because it's other worlds I'm going to be talking about tonight, exoplanets. So I will share my screen and then go and hit play. And hopefully you all will see, share, aha, there we go. So, um, I hope you all can see that. 
Let me see the chat room. Boy, when I go to full screen, Zoom is still, it, it works and it's great. But every now and again, I'm like, is this, how do I know if this is working? Um, let's see if somebody in the chat room can let me know. Ah, can You're see. Good. So I'm guessing that that means yes. Excellent. Um, all right. Very, uh, very good. So I will uh, give you my talk, Strange New Worlds. Um, I am a Star Trek fan. I've always loved that opening to Star Trek where they say they'll explore strange new worlds. And in the 60s and even uh, uh, during the time of some of the other uh, Star Trek shows when they were on TV, we didn't know if there were other planets orbiting other stars. And I'm gonna, I'll talk about that. Uh, and we didn't know what they'd be like if, if there were other planets out there. The planets in our solar system are weird enough. Um, but it seems that um, if you're going to talk about these planets that we are now discovering, and we're discovering them by the boatload, what are they like? And you know, what does this mean for the Earth? Are we going to find planets that look like the Earth? And, and not just, not just you know, the same size, the same mass, so you kind of have the same gravity, but are they really Earth-like? Are they going to have warm temperatures, water on the surface, breathable atmosphere? That's something we're still looking at. Um, so the subtitle of this is, is Earth special, right? As we're discovering all these planets and we're able to put Earth into context, something we've not really been able to do very well before, the question becomes, are there lots of Earths out there like Star Trek seems to say, or are there very, very few, which some science fiction series like you ever read Foundation by Isaac Asimov. And I think there's a series that's coming out soon about that. Um, in, those, in those books, planets were very, very rare like the Earth. Is one of them right? Neither, both? What's going on here? So uh, the answer to uh, cut to the chase is, uh, is there a special? No, or maybe, yes. It's complicated. And, and the thing is, it is complicated. Uh, it's not so much, is the earth special or not? You have to actually phrase the question carefully. And that's when you start to figure things out better. So let's take a look. I recognize this planet right away. Uh, this is Earth seen from the uh, Discover satellite, which is uh, orbiting the Earth really far out towards the sun, about, a, about a 1.5 million kilometers, something like that, a million miles. With its back to the sun, it faces the Earth. It always sees the Earth full. It takes a picture, every, uh, a few pictures every day. I like this shot. You know, Normally when you see the Earth from space, they're always careful to show you America uh, and, and that side of the world. Um, I actually like to show this side of the world because there's more land to see here. You can see Africa, um, you see the Sahara Desert, um, uh, some of the more temperate regions where there's a lot of vegetation, and of course, the ocean. And the thing about this picture is that this is easily recognizable as Earth. But if I were to show you this one, you might not recognize that as Earth right away, simply because you're not seeing any land masses that you're familiar with. Now, if you look at it carefully at the lower left, uh, Australia is down there. And in the upper right, you can see the west coast of the US. And you look down a little bit, maybe tilt your head, and you can see Baja California and Mexico. That's it. When you're looking down over the Pacific Ocean centered on it like this, um, you get a view of Earth, a perspective on Earth you might not be used to, and that is, it's a water planet. The, this entire hemisphere of the Earth is water. The Pacific Ocean is immense. And you're not just seeing water here. You're seeing three different phases, three different types of water. There's liquid water in the ocean there, obviously. And you can see clouds. That's water vapor, whereas water has been evaporated into the atmosphere. And at the very tippy top, it's not too easy to see. Um, and I think maybe right there at the bottom, right at the bottom, although it, I'm not 100% sure, uh, there's ice, right, in the Arctic and the Antarctic, the North and South Poles. So you have frozen water there. And uh, it turns out that that's important. The Earth is at uh, the right distance from the sun and has the right amount of air that water can be maintained in these three states sort of in equilibrium with each other. And so we have the water cycle. Water can evaporate, move to a different place, and then rain down, and you can have lakes and rivers and things like that. And it turns out that's fairly important for life. That transports minerals around, transports energy around. Life depends on that. Uh, and so Earth is, um, when you think about that, that's an interesting and, and possibly precarious set of circumstances that allows life on Earth to exist. So maybe in that case, Earth is special. Um, 
but oops, oh, dup, yep, yep. Hit my space bar twice. Hang on, there we go. Make sure, yep, yep, there we go. Ah, um, I wave my arms around a lot, that's gonna happen. Let's take a look at the Earth in the solar system. So here is uh, a relatively fanciful diagram of the solar system. The planets are shown to scale in size, but not distance. We're not that close to the sun, which is a good thing. We'd all be uh, vaporized if this were the case. And so you've got the eight planets. Yes, the eight planets. When I was a kid, there were nine planets, then there were eight. Now there are thousands. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, but these are the eight major planets in the solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are very small and closer into the sun. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, much larger and farther out. Uh, the solar system is fairly divided into these two types of planets, what we call the terrestrial planets, the small rocky planets, and the giant planets. Uh, and you can talk about Jupiter and Saturn being gas giants, Uranus and Neptune, we call them ice giants. That has to do with geophysics, and they're not really made of ice, they're still gaseous, but there's a reason it's called ice giants, a historical reason, doesn't matter right now. The point is, when you look at the solar system this way, um, you see that right? The biggest planets clearly are dominating the solar system and Earth is nothing like them. Uh, and so, yeah, okay, compared to some of the other planets in the solar system, we are kind of special. But let's look at the planets that are a little bit closer to Earth in size, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and say, are we like them? And the answer is, hey, kind of. Hmm. Um, there's uh, iron and metal in them, iron and other metals, uh, a lot of rock, uh, Venus and Mars have an atmosphere, but Venus's atmosphere is tremendously thick. Mars is very thin. Mars, it turns out, incredibly cold and smaller than Earth. Venus, which on paper kind of seems like Earth's twin. It's about the same size, the same mass, the same density. The surface gravity is very much the same. Um, the thing is, though, its atmosphere is incredibly thick, mostly carbon dioxide. That gives it a runaway greenhouse effect. And the surface temperature on Venus is hundreds and hundreds of degrees Celsius. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is. It's something like 450. Um, but basically, it's, it's much, much hotter than the inside of an oven set to broil. So the surface of Venus is just unbelievable. It's the worst place in the solar system to be, just about. Um, not to mention that the atmospheric pressure is 90 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. Um, that's like being down almost a kilometer below the surface of the ocean on Earth. That's how much pressure there is. Horrible place to be. Um, and so in the solar system, uh, the Earth is looking pretty, uh, pretty special, standing out by itself, unique even, in that it has the right temperature for us, uh, the right chemistry, the right uh, air and everything to support life as we know it. Now you got to be careful. We evolved here, right? And so you think that the Earth... May have, it, it seems specially made for us, but in fact, we have adapted to it over millions and millions of years. So um, it seems special, but in fact, you know, if, if there were life on Mars, they would say, oh, look at Mars. Mars is the best place in the solar system. We're unique. So you always have to be careful how you, how you phrase things here. Um, so when you look at the solar system, still, uh, the Earth is the only one to have liquid water on its surface. So uh, uh, that in itself is uh, very different than all the other planets. But the question now is, well, what about other planets? What about other, uh, what we call exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars and other solar systems? Well, uh, we started discovering these in the 1990s. The first ones were discovered in 1991, 1992, orbiting a pulsar, a dead star. And we don't, we're not really sure how those were made. Uh, they're very strange. The environment there is very different. But then it turns out three years later, the first planets were discovered around stars like the sun. Um, I'll get to them in just a moment. I'll get to the method that we use to find those planets. But once we understood that those planets existed, astronomers realized, hey, it's possible that if those planets pass directly in front of their star from our viewpoint, then they're going to actually block a little bit of the starlight. It's like an eclipse, like right when the moon blocks the sunlight. A planet is small and a star is very big. So the, the planet doesn't block much of the light, but it does block enough that if you have a sensitive telescope and you make a lot of measurements, you can see it. And we call this a transit. Now, although this was not the method that we first used to discover planets, it is now the most successful method of the 
more than 4,000 planets. I don't even know how many we have right now. I think it's like 4,500, but it's more than 4,000 planets that have been discovered orbiting other stars. The vast majority have been discovered using this transit method. So I've got this, this lovely animation. Nope, hang on. Got to click on it. There we go. So you see a star here and, and a, a planet orbiting it. When the planet is between us and the star, the light from the planet dips. That's what you're seeing on the right-hand side there. You, me you measure the starlight and you see this brightness and then boom, you lose a little bit of it as the planet passes in front of it. That is a transit. Now, typically uh, for a star like the sun and a planet like say Jupiter, which is uh, a 10th of the width of the sun, it blocks 1% of the light. It has 1% of the area of the sun as seen from Earth. And so, well, as seen from, uh, I should say, from a distance. So if you were observing from some distant star, looking and watching Jupiter transit the sun, this big dip that you see there on the right, that would be 1% of the sun's light. And if you want to measure that really accurately, you have to measure uh, uh, pretty well to see that dip uh, uh, pretty well. So um, this isn't the easiest thing to do, but it can be done. And in fact, with a lot of the planets that we're discovering, um, they are these sort of Jupiter-sized planets orbiting stars like the sun, sometimes smaller stars. They block more of the light. For some of these stars, you can do these measurements with a, an off-the-shelf telescope. You could go and buy uh, a nice 10 inch telescope, 25 centimeter telescope, put a digital camera on it and measure these transits yourself. Um, it's, it's kind of easy now, which is funny because we didn't even know we could do this 30 years ago, right? But now we're doing it almost routinely. And it turns out this was in front of us the whole time, but nobody really thought that you could do it. And it, it, it helped to have all these digital cameras out there as well. So I'll, let me just um, run this again, because this is important. Um, in some planets, actually, they go through phases like the moon does. Here it's Blocked, it's, when it's blocking the sun, we're seeing the dark side of the planet. But when it's moving around to the other side of the star, um, you're actually seeing the planet illuminated. And that actually adds light to the system, not very much. But in some cases, you can see that with some of these really super accurate uh, measurements we have, you can actually see the planet's phases as it's going around the star. There was a lot of doubt at first that we were actually seeing exoplanets. Astronomers were saying, it could be sunspots, they could be binary stars, two stars orbiting each other affecting your telescope. Could be a lot of things. But as we started to see more and more of these effects, there were fewer and fewer people who were saying, no, these aren't planets. And now everybody's on board. It's been, been a long time. We know what's going on here. Uh, so that's, that's very cool that you can do this. Now, it turns out, there, this is the uh, method I'm going to talk about now, where we actually did find the first planets, what's called reflex velocity. If you have a star and a planet, the planet's orbiting the star because of the star's gravity. So this planet's making a big circle around the star. But the planet has gravity as well. And so it's tugging on the star. So it's not so much that the planet is orbiting the star, it's that they're both orbiting their center of mass, their center of gravity, what we call technically the Berry Center, if you want to impress people at cocktail parties, if those ever happen again. Uh, and so in this diagram on the left, on this animation, you can see a star and a planet. And as the planet moves around the star, the star makes a little circle orbiting their center of gravity. Now, if you were to be uh, observing this from the edge, the, on the left, you're looking face down on this system, right? You're looking down on the orbit of this planet. On the right, the geometry is different. Here, we're seeing that planet orbiting edge on. And if it does that, you'll notice it's transiting, by the way. You can see that it's transiting there and then going behind the star and coming back around and transiting there. Um, as this is happening, the star is moving back and forth. You can see it's sort of moving left and right there. Usually that's too small to measure. We don't have um, telescopes powerful enough to see that left to right motion. In most cases, there are a couple of times we've been able to see that. The star is actually sort of wiggling as it's, as it's moving through space and we can detect that. More importantly though, as that planet is moving around the star and that star is making that little circle, sometimes that star is headed toward us and sometimes away from us, toward us and away from us. And when it's moving toward us, the light from that star gets Doppler shifted. And as it gets Doppler shifted toward the blue, and then when it moves away, it's Doppler shifted towards the red, it's red shifted. Now you're familiar with this, even if you don't know about the Doppler shift with light, if you're sitting by the side of a road and a motorcycle goes by and you hear it and it goes, right? 
the pitch, the sound of that motorcycle engine is higher when it's approaching you and drops when it goes past you. So it's ear. That is almost exactly the same physics, very similar physics going on with light. So when an object is moving towards you, it's light shifts to the blue. It gets higher pitch, if you want to think of it that way. When it's moving away, the light gets red shifted. It gets to a longer wavelength. The pitch drops. This can be measured. It's not easy because we're not talking about hugely high velocities here. Um, but this is, in fact, how the first few planets were found. Uh, and now um, that this method has been found for lots and lots of planets. Um, this is really important because with the transit method, if you know how bright the star is, you can measure how big the planet is. If you see a 1% dip in the starlight, then you can say, oh, the planet must be 10% the width of the star. Um, but that doesn't tell you the mass. So you don't know if you're looking at a planet that's you know, big and puffy or you know, big and dense. The transit method only tells you the size. The reflex velocity tells you the mass because the more massive a planet is, the more gravity it has, the more it tugs on the star. And so you might not know how big the planet is doing the reflex velocity method, but you can measure how massive it is. If you can do both, if the planet is transiting and you can measure the reflex velocity, that gives you the size of the planet, it gives you the mass of the planet, and that tells you the most important thing of all, the density. And the density is important because iron is very dense. Water is not very dense. And so you can put these two methods together and immediately say, oh, this planet's very dense. It has a lot of metal in it. It has a lot of rock in it. Or this planet, not terribly dense, might be a water world. And so you can actually tell what the planet is made of, even though you cannot see it directly using either of these methods. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that again a little bit more in a sec, because I do want to talk about one method that uh, just kills me. Oh, oh, skipped ahead. Sorry. I want to say um, we have a lot of dedicated observatories that look for transits of planets. You may have heard of the Kepler Observatory. That ran for a few years. Uh, right now, the, the big one that NASA has running is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. I always have to think about that. Um, this is orbiting the Earth and is sweeping the sky, basically looking at thousands of stars all the time and, and looking for transits and, and looking at um, nearby stars for planets orbiting them. Um, the European Space Agency just la launched one called CHEOPS, C-H-E-O-P-S, cannot remember what that stands for, um, but it's basically doing the same sort of uh, science, looking for transiting exoplanets. I did mention that you can't see the planets directly using these methods, but it turns out in some circumstances, we can see these planets. Typically, um, if you look in the infrared at young, okay, let me, let me switch that around. Uh, let me start with the planet themselves. When planets are very young and stars are very young, when they're still forming or they've just formed, they're just a few million years old, the planet is still incredibly hot from the heat of its formation. It's forming by basically stuff hitting it all the time, asteroids and, and, and things hitting it. That heats it up. And when something is hot, it can glow in the infrared. So if you use a big telescope that has an infrared camera on it, point it at young stars, you can sometimes see planets orbiting them. In this example, this is Beta Pictoris, a relatively nearby star um, that we knew for a long time, since the 1980s, maybe forming planets because we knew that there was too much infrared light coming from it to just be coming from the star. And so astronomers said, there must be a lot of dust orbiting the star that's being warmed by the star and that's in emitting infrared light. Uh, it turns out that's correct. And in fact, when uh, they pointed better telescopes at it, you could actually see uh, a planet orbiting the star. Now in the upper left, in November 2003, you see the star is actually blocked out. The stars are incredibly bright. They're much brighter than the planets. So we use a lot of sophisticated methods to suppress the starlight, make it look fainter. And the planet pops right out in some of these pictures. So you can see it there in the upper left in November 2003. This is um, way out in the infrared. And it's labeled there, exoplanet Beta Pictoris B. Beta Pictoris is the star, little b is the planet. When you go to October 2009, uh, six years later, it shows you where the planet was in 2003 in the upper left. But six years later, hey, look at that. It's down there in the bottom right. Uh, it has moved around the star in those six years. We are seeing the orbit of this planet nearly edge on. Um, and in those intervening years, the planet had moved around the star. And you can see in the bottom image there, um, uh, it shows you the, uh, uh, 
uh, the size of Saturn's orbit at the same orientation we see this planet. So if, if you were in this, looking in our solar system, almost edge on, you, you'd see Saturn's orbit elongated like that. That's kind of how we're seeing this planet's orbit. And there in March 2010, just a few months after the, the last picture, you can see the planet again has moved a little bit. Um, so not only can we directly see these planets, we can see them orbiting their stars. That just destroys me that we can actually do this. This is uh, amazing, amazing science. Uh, and so we've done this with lots of other planets. Here's HR8799, another young nearby star um, using the Gemini telescope, an enormous telescope. Um, it, they've actually discovered four planets orbiting the star. You can see three of them here, uh, B, C, and D, taken in July of 2004. Again, the star, you don't see it. The light from that has been suppressed. Uh, that brings the planets out. Not only that, um, but I love this. This is an animation taken using um, observations over several years of HR8799. And whoop, that didn't work. Try that again. There we go. And you can see those four planets moving. Look at that. There's one over on the left and three on the right. And I'll play it again. You can see that inner planet moving fairly rapidly uh, and the other three moving relatively slowly. <laughs> so you, could, you can take enough images over the course of five years to actually see the motion in an animation. You are seeing four planets orbiting another star in this graph graphic. That is phenomenal. And from this, we can we can measure by measuring their motion, we can get their orbits. That tells us how far they are from the star. We can learn a lot about the planets this way. So uh, I guess the point I'm making here is that we can find a lot of planets. We're getting really good at this, so we can get a lot of information out of them. So what are we finding? There is a concept called the habitable zone. And that is the distance from a star, a planet is, where liquid water can exist on its surface. Now, you got to be careful because it's, it's not like a, a, a rigid distance from the star. It's a region uh, distance from the star. Like there's an inner and outer part of that zone. And theoretically, if you have a planet in there, it could have liquid water on its surface. Now, you got to be careful because Venus is inside the sun's habitable zone. So is Mars. And neither of them have, uh, neither of them has liquid water on its surface, but the Earth does. So just because you find a planet in there doesn't mean it's habitable. It just means, hey, maybe it could be. Um, and in fact, if you swapped Mars and Venus uh, and let Venus cool off and maybe warm Mars up, it's possible they might be able to have liquid water on their surface. You have to give Mars more atmosphere and take away some from Venus. Nitpicking. I'll let, I'll let engineers figure out how to do that. But the point is, uh, if you're in the habitable zone, that allows you to have liquid water on your surface. Why is that important? As I mentioned earlier, life on Earth depends on water. Uh, and water is a really simple molecule. It's just you know an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Those exist everywhere in the universe. We see this everywhere. It's all throughout our solar system. Uh, and when we look at other planets and other stars that are forming planets, um, gas clouds in space where stars are forming, we see lots of hydrogen and plenty of oxygen. So water, um, should be fairly ubiquitous. And if you have a planet in the habitable zone, it can be liquid. And if it's liquid, that means minerals and stuff can move around inside of it. And you can start building up more and more complex molecules and eventually maybe get life. That is not to say uh, life may, uh, life can't use some other liquid or some other medium to form. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's the way it works on Earth. So we know that works. So hey, why not look for that around other systems? Look for liquid water or, or, or planets that potentially have liquid water on them, because at least that way, we know that they have a chance at having life. That makes sense. So we're not precluding you know, to go back to Star Trek, silicon-based life, the Horda, if you remember that. Um, we're, not, we're not saying that can't happen. We're just saying maybe, but it seems a lot easier to use water. So different stars have different habitable zones. A hot star has a habitable zone that starts farther out, but extends much farther too. It's actually much wider than it would be for a sun-like star. So the top one, you see a hot star, and uh, the green is where uh, it's just right. The red is too hot, the blue is too cold, and the green is just right. In fact, some people call this the Goldilocks zone, uh, which, you know, I get the story is called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. However, to be, to be honest, 
It should be called the baby bear zone if you think about it, because the papa bear stuff was always, you know, too hot or whatever, and the mama bear stuff was too cold, and the baby bear stuff was just right. So uh, for some reason, we named this after Goldilocks, which is like just grossly unfair. Um, so the green is where planets can have possibly liquid water on their surface. Uh, for sun-like stars, it's that, that region is narrower and closer to the star. And for cooler stars, and this is important, that region is even narrower and even closer to that star. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If a star isn't as hot as the sun, you have to be closer to it to be warmer. If you're you know, close to a campfire, um, uh, you can stay warm. But if you replace that campfire with a match, you're going to freeze to death. You got to get really close to get warm. So um, if we find planets orbiting a cooler star, but they're the same distance, say, Earth is from the sun, they may be frozen. Uh, they've got to be much, much closer to that star to be able to uh, be warm enough to have water on. So now you know what a habitable zone is. Have we found planets in stars' habitable zones? And the answer is, yeah, we found a lot of them. Um, now, these aren't to scale. Um, this is just showing you an example. G stars are stars like the sun. The Earth orbits a star like the sun. The Earth does, in fact, orbit the sun, very much like the sun. Um, Kepler 452b, which was found by uh, the Kepler uh, Observatory, um, is a planet orbiting in the habitable zone of its star. K stars are slightly cooler than the sun, and we found lots of examples of those. And we've even found them around M stars, what you think of as red dwarfs. Uh, and we're finding plenty of stars in the habitable zone of those. This is sort of an old graphic. There are lots more that we found since this graphic was made. Uh, including, you may have heard of the system TRAPPIST-1, which is a red dwarf which has seven planets orbiting it, um, three of which are orbiting in its habitable zone. Um, we don't know if they have liquid water on them. They might, uh, but we know that they're in the right distance from that star. And it turns out they orbit that star much, much closer in than even Mercury orbits the sun. The reason that's important is because M stars, these red dwarfs, are by far the most common type of star in the galaxy. It's like 80%, something like that, of all stars in the galaxy are these red dwarfs. And we're finding, interestingly, that they make planets pretty efficiently. A lot of them have planets. So um, it looks like if you were to count up all the planets in the galaxy, if you could do that, um, the vast majority of them would be orbiting these red dwarfs. Stars like the sun um, would be in the minority. And that's interesting because that brings us back to the original question, is Earth special? And the answer is kinda. It, it's not in that, um, you know, how many planets are in the habitable zone of their stars? And it turns out tons, we're finding lots of planets like that. But if you looked at all the planets orbiting in the habitable zones of their stars, the minority of them will be orbiting stars like the sun. The vast majority will be orbiting red dwarfs. So in that, in that sense, Earth is special. On the other hand, how does that make Earth special except by number? And the answer is probably not. The amount of heat and light it gets from its stars is about the same as with these other planets. So when it comes to the physics, eh, pretty much the same for all these planets. So Earth's not that special that way. And this is what I mean by, you have to ask the right questions. Another question you can ask is, well, how big are these planets orbiting in the habitable zones of their stars? Are they gas giants like Jupiter or are they smaller planets like Earth? And that's important because Jupiter doesn't have a surface. It's just basically gas all the way down. This is more complicated than that, but it's not like Earth with a, a solid surface you can stand on and air above you. And it turns out we found um, a lot of planets that are similar. Uh, they tend to be a little bit bigger than Earth orbiting in the habitable zones, but we are finding planets like that. So in that case, it's like, oh, maybe the Earth isn't special. Well, <laughs> this gets even cooler. This is the only graph I've got. If you don't like graphs, don't sweat it. This one's not too hard to understand. Um, it's just showing you how many planets we've discovered. And this is as of four years ago. I've not been able to find a good update to this graph. I found ones like it, but they're a lot more complicated. Um, this is just a bar graph. Um, as you go left to right, left is small planets and they get bigger as you move to the right. And the taller the bar is, the more of them we found. So if you start on the left, you can see that little tiny bar. Those are Mars-sized planets, and we haven't found very many of those. And it turns out it's not because there are few of them. It just turns out they're hard to find. Uh, a small planet, if it transits its star, doesn't block very much light, and so that's tougher to see. And with the reflex velocity method, smaller planets tend to be lower mass. They're not pulling on their stars as hard, and that makes the reflex velocity harder to measure. So 
Um, it's just, that it's not that they're not out there, it's that they're harder to find. So that's why we don't see too many of those, we think. You look at our size planets, we're, we found quite a bit more. Um, those are easier to find, um, but still not easy. And it could be that we're still suffering from that same effect, that they're smaller and a little bit more difficult to find. Now, let's skip over those two tall winds and go to the, the Neptune size, the Jupiter size there on the right. Jupiter sized planets, super easy to find, right? You can literally detect them from your backyard if you have the right equipment. And most of the first planets that we found were these Jupiter sized planets orbiting their stars. So if the universe were filled with these things, because they're so easy to find, we can be pretty confident that we're finding them. Uh, and so you'd expect that that bar graph would be really high if there were a lot of them, but it's still pretty low. If we're doing a good job of finding them, that, that number that we're finding is low, that's telling you that there aren't that many of them. Uh, Jupiter planets are sort of the exception compared to smaller planets. And when you look in the middle of the graph, you see what planets we're finding. We're finding planets that are super Earths, up to about twice the size of the Earth, or mini Neptunes, which are roughly two to four times the size of the Earth. And this is diameter, by the way. So we're not talking about, you know, volume or anything like that. Neptune is very roughly four times the diameter of the Earth. Um, and these are the kind of planets we're finding the most of. Uh, and so this is telling you right now, as far as we know, these are the most common kind of planets in the galaxy that we're finding. These super Earths, ones that are up to about twice the size of the Earth, and mini Neptunes from two to four. Um, this is the kind of planet that stars like to make, uh, or apparently make them the easiest. And that is really interesting, because if you noticed, we don't have a planet like that in the solar system. It goes basically from Earth to Neptune. It makes that big jump. Now, maybe there's this planet nine, which is orbiting way out in the outer solar system. We haven't discovered it yet. If it exists, theoretically, it should be maybe a mini Neptune or a super Earth. We're not sure. Uh, we haven't as we discovered, we don't know. Um, but um, if it exists, it probably would fall in this part of the graph. But if it doesn't exist, that's more interesting. Be well, I shouldn't say it's more interesting. It's very interesting if there's another planet in our solar system. But the fact of the matter is most stars have most stars with planets have this kind of planet, and we do not see them in the solar system. That's interesting. Um, does that make us unique? among stars in the galaxy? Maybe. I mean, there are stars out there without these kinds of planets, but they are definitely in the minority. Most of, these, most of the planets we're finding are like that. So, you know, is that important? Does it matter? Is there some physics involved that if you make planets this size, it's harder or easier to make a planet like the Earth? Nobody really knows. But it's interesting. You want to, you want to kind of take note of everything that makes us different in some way from other stars. Now, I've been all over the place here with, is the earth unique? Yes, no, maybe, right? Well, do we really need to be looking at earth? Was Goldilocks too picky? Do we really need to be in the habitable zone of a, of a star to have liquid water accessible to life? And the answer is no. In this picture of Jupiter, you can see two moons. The one on the right there, uh, just below the center of Jupiter is Io, the volcano moon. But to the lower left there is Europa. And this is a moon that's mostly made of water ice. Um, it's about the size of Earth's moon, about, very roughly. Um, but instead of being rock like our moon is, it's mostly made of ice. And I mean water ice. Uh, and it turns out, here's a close-up of it taken um, some years ago by a probe. I believe it was the Galileo probe. Um, you can see that it's mostly white. This has been color enhanced. Um, the entire surface of this thing is covered in ice. There's this reddish stuff on there. Um, those are complex organic molecules, carbon-based molecules. And it turns out that uh, we now know that Europa has a thick shell of ice over a liquid water ocean. There is liquid water underneath the surface of this moon. As it's orbiting Jupiter, it gets compressed and, ex and, and uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Stressed and strained, basically. It's squeezed and expands and squeezed and expands as it's orbiting Jupiter. And that heats it up. Basically, it's friction that heats up the interior of this moon and has melted the ice there. And we know there's a huge ocean. And in fact, there's more liquid water under the surface of Europa than there is on the surface of the Earth. So there's actually more water there. 
not only that, it has a core that we think is rocky. And so the water, where the water is, is touching that core, there's a lot of mineral exchange. And the core is probably warm as well. There may be vents cracked open where minerals spew out uh, into the water there. That's just like on Earth. We have these, um, these what are called black smokers, cracks in the Earth's crust uh, where um, chemicals are being spewed out and uh, mixing in with the water around the ocean. And it turns out even though they're boiling hot, uh, toxic chemicals for us, life can thrive on that stuff. And there are these tube worms, you've probably seen pictures of them, eerie looking things. Um, but life loves that stuff. It's just not like us. So Europa is nothing like Earth in that it's five times farther from the sun, frozen cold, orbiting Jupiter, tremendous radiation on its surface from Jupiter's magnetic field, and yet it may have life under its surface. We don't know. Here's another icy moon, Enceladus. I love this shot of it. Um, this is orbiting Saturn, a picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft a few years ago. If you look at the bottom, you can see those four parallel sort of bluish stripes. Those are cracks in the surface, and it turns out those are spewing out water. Uh, there are geysers shooting water out uh, into space from Enceladus. And we know that there's liquid water under the surface there too. Another ocean of water under the surface of Enceladus. And you can see them here backlit uh, by the sun uh, shooting out into space. Another shot taken by Cassini. So clearly, right, these icy moons can have water under the surface because they're warmed as they orbit their planets. Enceladus um, was the first one we saw directly because that water is shooting out into space. Uh, Europa, we, we were pretty sure indirectly for a long time. And by the way, Cassini flew through those plumes and detected heavy molecules, which are probably organic molecules. Now again, organic doesn't mean life, it means carbon-based, but um, complex molecules that we depend on, that life depends on, are, are carbon-based molecules. So it's entirely possible there's life under the surface of these moons. And not just these moons, it turns out a lot of these icy moons could have oceans underneath them. Rhea and Titania orbiting Uranus, Oberon, uh, Triton, which orbits Neptune, very large moon, as it turns out. Um, even Eris and Sedna, these two objects orbiting way out past Pluto, they're big enough that they could have liquid water oceans under their surface, even though uh, they're extremely cold, there would be no sunlight either. Um, but they would be getting their energy from the heat of, uh, of the core of these objects. Plenty of water, plenty, plenty of chemicals you need for life. So maybe, maybe they have life and they are nothing like Earth. So it kind of makes Earth unique in the solar system. You think, well, we are the only ones that have liquid water on the surface, but it turns out we're not unique at all for having accessible liquid water. And so the Earth is not unique in that sense. Even Pluto may have a liquid water ocean underneath it. So who knows? Are we still being too, too picky looking at water? Maybe. It turns out Titan, the second largest moon in the solar system, bigger than the planet Mercury, has a very thick atmosphere of nitrogen uh, around it. It's even thicker than Earth's atmosphere. This is a shot, again, by Cassini of, um, you can see Saturn, the rings are edge on, that's that line, you can see the shadow of the rings on the planet, and that big fuzzy sort of orangish ball in front of it, that's Titan. Titan is quite large uh, and has that thick atmosphere, but it's extremely cold. Water, uh, there could be liquid water as an ocean underneath it, um, but on the surface, the water, it's so cold, it's frozen harder than granite is on Earth. So it's, it's basically, you could make mountains out of water on Titan. But it doesn't matter because it turns out there's another liquid on the surface of Titan, and that is methane. Um, this is a radar map made of Titan some years ago by uh, the Cassini probe. Now, when, you, when, you, you, uh, when, it, when it's passing by Titan, it would beam it with radar, just like a cop uses a radar gun when it's seen cars go by, when we've seen cars go by. The radar penetrates Titan's atmosphere and bounces back up to the spacecraft, and you can measure uh, topography this way. If there's a mountain, then the radar pulse doesn't have to travel quite as far. So it gets back to you more quickly. And you can say, oh, if it's getting back to me faster, that means there's a mountain. If it takes a little bit longer, maybe it hit a valley. It had farther to travel to come back. Moreover, if it hits a liquid, liquid tends to absorb radar. So you get nothing back. It's just black. And when they made these maps of Titan near the North Pole, 
um, they found these huge regions where they weren't getting a very good radar return. And look at it, that looks like a lake, doesn't it? It has tributaries that feed into it. Um, it's coming, th those tributaries are coming from highlands around it, those are hills around it. Uh, and uh, we know that there's plenty of, uh, of carbon on Titan. And so those we think are lakes of methane. What, what would be a gas in Earth's atmosphere is cold enough to be a liquid there. Not only that, with Titan's thick atmosphere, the methane can evaporate and become clouds and then flow over, you know, evaporate off the lake, flow over the mountains, snow out or rain out over the mountains, and then flow down back into that lake. That's what you're seeing here. Um, and we've seen changes in these lakes over time as well. So it looks like what we have a water cycle on Earth, Titan has a methane cycle. Um, plenty of carbon, right, to make organic molecules with. So who knows, maybe there is some other kind of life on Titan and it uses methane, liquid methane for its medium, not water. Got to be open-minded here. And hey, we're talking about planets that are frozen or moons that are frozen. We're talking about different kinds of liquid. Maybe we need to expand our minds and maybe say, what about in the past or in the future? When you look at Mars now, it's very dry. There's, there's water on it, but it's all frozen. Uh, there's no liquid water on it, um, but there's lots of evidence it used to. Billions of years ago, there was standing water on Mars, and we see tons of evidence for it. We see dry riverbeds, creek beds. We see pebbles on the surface that have been sorted as water flows. Um, lighter, smaller pebbles tend to, tend to flow with the water better than bigger, heavier pebbles. And you can see that, that the heavier pebbles haven't traveled as far as the lighter pebbles. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Gale Crater, which is where the Curiosity Rover is right now, was a standing lake for a long time. There is clay on the surface there that we've seen. We've measured that from orbit. And you get clay when you have standing water. The Perseverance rover, which is on its way to Mars right now and is going to land in February, is going to land in Jezero Crater, or Jezero, I'm not sure how to pronounce it exactly. Plenty of evidence for there having been water in Jezero Crater as well. So uh, you look at Mars three billion years ago, it was more, it looked more like the way the Earth does now than the Earth did three billion years ago. Mars was Earth-like before Earth was Earth-like. So, you know, maybe Mars had life and maybe it's all dead. That kind of sucks. But on the other hand, if Mars was warm and wet three billion years ago and life arose there, that's still evidence of there having been life elsewhere than Earth. And that gives, you, gives us great hope for there being life even uh, farther out there in the universe because there are going to be more environments. And we're learning, look, big moons, icy moons, don't maybe need water, sometime in the past, sometime in the future. What we're finding is the conditions necessary for life um, may be a lot more ubiquitous than we originally thought. So here is a shot of the Earth seen from the moon. Our moon is very different than Earth. Um, there's no liquid water on it. There's water frozen in deep craters. Uh, it's mixed in with the rocks, but be pretty hard to, uh, to develop life on that. But I, I love this picture. This is taken um, by Apollo 8. This is the famous Earthrise picture when they orbited the moon um, and they saw the Earth rising above the lunar limb as they were orbiting the moon. And it, it kind of, I love this because it shows you how barren and alien the moon is. Um, and the Earth, this gorgeous blue and white globe floating in the vastness of space. You don't see any stars there because the stars are too faint to show up in this picture. But it gives you a sense of uh, how alone we are, how distant we are, and how beautiful the Earth is. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to leave you with this, um, this shot. This is my favorite picture of the Earth. It's taken by the Rosetta probe, which is the one that orbited uh, the comet 67P churyumov gerasimenko which just rolls off the tongue um, if you have enough practice. Uh, a lot of people just call it 67P. It's the one that orbited that comet, taking all those amazing close-up pictures. The comet looked like a rubber ducky. Um, but it had to pass by the Earth and took this incredible picture that we don't usually see. We don't usually see a picture of the Earth as a crescent. I love this for a lot of reasons because it's unusual, it's gorgeous, but also it makes the Earth look like another planet. Um, because we're so used to seeing the Earth as a globe, seeing it as a crescent kind of puts it in context that, yeah, it's our planet, but it is a planet, and there are lots of other planets out there. Some of them are completely inhospitable, super Jupiters, too close to their star, too far away. But even so, if those Jupiters are 
far enough away that they have frozen icy moons, they may still have conditions ripe for life. So is the Earth special? Well, yes, no, maybe. It's complicated, right? It depends on the question you ask. And the question that's important for me is, right, is it special to us? We evolved here. You know, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and I know what it's like to go up 10, 12,000 feet, barely be able to breathe, right? The conditions that we need for life are, are very thin. Uh, and I know that our atmosphere is good and, our, and the, the, the oceans are good and the chemistry mix is good, the temperature is good. Is there special? Probably not. There are probably billions of planets like Earth out there in the galaxy, but there's only one like ours. And so is the Earth special? Hell yes, it is. And that's it. Thank you very much. There's thunderous applause happening. You just can't yes, hear I can. it because everybody's muted. <laughs> but. Yes. I hear the wind blowing outside. We're having a windy day. So I'll just, that's the wind from people clapping. Cool. Do you have time for some uh, questions, Phil? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, we got a bunch. I do? Gonna... Oh, I ended right on time. Holy cow. I never do that. <laughs> is this talk special? Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. All right, we got a bunch of questions from the members here, and uh, I'm going to split them up with our publicity chair, Sharifa. And uh, first question is from John Pinto. John asks, compared to other planets I've read about, the Earth is relatively water poor. Can you comment on that? Um, that's an interesting thing to say. Again, right, it depends on how you phrase the question. You look at Europa, there's more water under, under Europa than there is on Earth's surface. On the other hand, we know there's water in Earth's mantle, and it turns out... Um, <clears throat> studies seem to indicate that there's about three times as much water in the Earth's mantle as there is on the surface, but it's not liquid water. It's sort of bound up in minerals. Um, so the Earth has water. Uh, you look at Venus, uh, not much at all. Uh, it's way too hot and it's been baked out of the crust. Um, Mars has less than Earth as well. On the other hand, um, we are discovering exoplanets that um, when you look at their mass and their size, their density is pretty low, uh, much lower than Earth's. Earth's actually pretty dense, about five and a half times the density of water. So if you had a, you had a cubic centimeter of, of, uh, of, of water, the size of a six-sided die, it would weigh a gram. If you had that of the sort of the average material the Earth's made of, it would weigh five and a half grams, substantially more. But some of these planets have average densities of like three, which means they probably don't have as much metal in them and they may have more water. Uh, and so, yeah, there are a lot of planets out there that have a lot of water on them. Um, and again, you know, water is not special to Earth at all. We see it everywhere we look in space. Not, you know, in a star because stars are very hot and water can't exist in a star. But the hydrogen and oxygen is there. And when we look at things like comets, uh, we see um, in, in gas clouds, there's, there's lots of water. These gas clouds which form stars and planets. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, if you look at the numbers, um, uh, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, there's, there's water in their atmospheres as well, but it's all spread out as a gas. Um, Earth may be water poor. Um, I don't know how important that is. We have our water on our surface, which makes it easy for life to exist on the surface. Uh, and happily, you know, the atmosphere, the amount of heat we get from the sun, it all works for us. Um, so, you know, know, maybe maybe we could do without less water. Maybe we could do fine with more water. Uh, and so it just, you know, we just don't know enough about these other planets yet to know what the conditions are like, if, if they're Earth-like or not. Um, you might find another planet that has exactly the same amount of water as Earth, but it's frozen or it's mixed with some horrible chemical that, you know, like a, a hydrogen peroxide or something that makes organic molecules much more difficult to make. Um, so even if those planets do have more water, it's hard to say what, what that really means. Thank you. I'm making this up as I go along. <laughs> we have a question from Eric Hoyne. Uh, the planets in our solar system have names. Are, are the exoplanets named or numbered according to location? This is a good question. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it gets to the point where you know, especially if you're a Star Trek fan, you're like, which planet was that? Uh, you know, they give them all names and, and we're going to run out of names. Uh, here's the thing. I didn't actually say this in the, uh, in the talk, but we're looking at nearby stars. We're looking at more distant stars. Um, 
most planets have, we can only detect them if we're seeing those orbits edge on. But if the orbit's like this, we may not see them at all. So extrapolating from the number that we do see, we're missing something like 90% of the planets. And when you do all the math, you find out that planets, stars with planets are more common in the galaxy than stars without planets. Um, maybe I should phrase this more, more delicately. Um, it may be that there are lots of, lots of stars without planets, but stars that do have planets may have solar systems like we do. And the point is, there may be more planets than stars in the galaxy. There are something like 200 billion stars in the galaxy. There could be more than 200 billion planets and substantially more. Um, if you want to come up with 200 billion names, uh, that could be difficult. You're going to start having a lot of names that are just strings of, of, of letters and numbers. So for now, what we do is we have a naming convention. We say if we find a planet around a star, um, we, give it, we, we give it the star's name with a lowercase b. We don't give it an a um, because that can be confusing with, with binary stars. Um, you can think of, uh, there are a lot of ways of thinking of it, but it just to avoid confusion, we call it b. The next planet discovered is c and then d and e. The problem with that is you might discover an outer planet first and an inner planet later. So the outer planet might be B, the inner planet might be C, and you kind of want to think of going out, you know, out from the star, it would be B, C, D, E. It gets a little confusing. But for now, this is, this is the way we do it. And um, it's consistent, at least, the name of the star plus the lowercase number, a lowercase letter, I mean. And so that's, that's what we're doing. Informally, there are some planets that have been given names. Uh, 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 I can't remember. There are a couple of them now, and I can't think of what they're called. These aren't official names. There's an organization called the International Astronomical Union, the IUE, the IUE, sorry, that's a satellite, the IAU. The IAU is the official keeper of names. They don't, I don't think at this point, they accept official names for these exoplanets. Um, they're having a hard time just naming moons around Jupiter right now. There's so many moons to name. Um, maybe someday when we start categorizing these or characterizing them better, looking at them with bigger telescopes, maybe visiting them someday with interstellar probes. That's way off. We'll start giving them names. But for now, they get catalog numbers. It's the way it's got to be. Cool. All right, we're going to jump to uh, Kevin Friedis. Uh, but first, I want to remind people watching, if you're not already a member of CFAST, head to CFAST.org. We do this every month, guys. But anyway, Kevin says, thanks so much for speaking today, Phil. I agree. Do you know what kind of progress has been made in optical interferometry as a method for possibly directly imaging exoplanets? Um, I, okay, to answer the question first, uh, no, I don't know. Um, I, should, I should read more about that. that uh, this is a technique where you have two telescopes at some distance apart observing the same target at the same time, and you measure the light coming in extremely accurately. You time how that light is coming in. And as the light, uh, you can combine the light from these two telescopes um, and the light makes interference patterns. You, you may be familiar with this the example I always use. If you're sitting in the tub and you rock back and forth and you make waves. And sometimes if these waves hit each other, you get a big splash and sometimes you have a wave hit a trough and they, they cancel each other out. Um, this same technique uh, can be used with astronomy and it's called interferometry. You're, you're interfering the waves with each other. This is also how we detect gravitational waves. These, these merging black holes make gravitational waves and, and um, uh, LIGO, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, if I got that right, something like that, uses the same sort of technique. The beauty of this technique is very difficult. Um, the beauty of the technique is um, it gives you the same resolution, the same ability to see fine details as a single telescope, the size of the distance between these two telescopes. So you can take two small telescopes and put them 100 meters apart, and it's almost like you have a 100 meter telescope. Not exactly, there are a lot of differences, but um, it makes it somewhat easier to observe uh, things like planets orbiting other stars. But you still kind of have the same problem. The star is incredibly bright, the planet's incredibly faint, and you gotta deal with that. So I'm not exactly sure I'm not exactly sure what the state of the art is with that right now, um, but it could be that uh, years ago, um, about 20 years ago, NASA was thinking about building an interferometer in space, and I believe it was called the Terrestrial Planet Finder, um, TPF, and this was going to be telescopes that were separated by some distance orbiting out or just out in space. Um, 
so you can maintain a, a, you know how far apart they are really well. You don't have to worry about the Earth's atmosphere. And it would use this technique. And you'd be able to see planets the size of the Earth. And in fact, if you make this big enough, you could see details on the planet, like continents and oceans. Technically, yeah, you can, you can do that. The problem is the, the technology is very complex. <laughs> and so that's a ways away. And they decided to build things like Kepler and TESS first. I'm still hoping we'll build something like that sometime in the future. Or was it SIM, Space Interferometry Mission? I don't know. But if you look it up, you, you'll find it. But it's been shelved indefinitely. I don't know when they're going to make it. We have a question from Alex, and you touched on this a little bit, but not strictly exoplanet related, but what's your take on Planet Nine theory? Um, so I mentioned this in the talk, um, that there could be another planet orbiting the sun, which is um, uh, called Planet Nine. And uh, it's theoretical, but the idea is that as it's orbiting the sun, there are lots of these icy bodies out there way out past Neptune. And there are a lot of names for them. Trans-Neptunian objects is kind of the most generic one, TNOs, because they're, they're past Neptune. And as this planet orbits the sun, its gravity over billions of years has changed the orbits of these comets and kind of aligned them all up a certain way. So you'd expect that these, these I, I'm sorry, I called them comets because they're giant icy bodies, which is kind of like what a comet is. But with these TNOs, they could be orbiting the sun every which way. But as we discover more and more of them at, at that distance, we're finding that their orbits are all kind of aligned in, in more or less the same way. Uh, and that's really suspicious. And um, the people who have been working on this have said, the odds of this happening are very, very low. Um, it may be because of the way we observe the sky, we're only finding ones like that, that there are, there, they are really every which way, but those are the easiest to find. But the more you look at it, the, the harder it is to support that argument. And it really does look like, yeah, something's out there aligning all these planets up. And the beauty of that is, or excuse me, all of these objects up. The beauty of that is that lets you turn that around and say, where would this object be? Where would this planet be? And how massive is it? And it turns out it's, it's probably between 10 and 25 times the mass of the Earth, something like that, which would make it kind of sort of a mini Neptune or a super Earth. Um, and it would be, oh, way the hell and gone, out, out, out there past the sun. Um, but it also tells you sort of where in the sky you can look. And so there's, there's been this search that's been going on for a few years, searching that area of the sky. They haven't come up with anything yet, um, but it's hard. It's not that easy to do this. It's going to be a faint object and it's not moving very rapidly. So it's very difficult to find. Um, Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan, who are the two guys looking for it, um, you're not going to be able to get them nailed down on when they're going to find it, but they think that probably if it's out there, they'll find it in the next few years. So it could be that, you know, in 2026 or so, uh, we'll have another planet orbiting the sun. And if we do, I hope they name it Persephone, um, because that she was the, uh, the daughter of, of Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, who uh, went down into hell. Pluto abducted her. And uh, if you've read the myth that she eats the six pomegranate seeds and stays down there six months of the year, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is that Objects out past Neptune tend to be named after underworld myths. Um, and since she's affiliated with Pluto, and I know Pluto's not a planet anymore, or however you feel about that, naming this planet Persephone, I think would be very appropriate. Very cool. We have tons of questions here and not a lot of time. You want to take a couple okay. more, Phil? Sure, I'll try to keep my answers shorter. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to pick one at random here. Uh, this one's from Leon Ramirez, who asked an interesting one. Is there any way with our current technology to terraform Venus somehow? <laughs> no, um, not with our current technology. It's hard to get to Venus in the first place. It's one of the reasons we haven't sent too many missions there. Um, it's it's kind of easier to get farther out from the sun. It's tougher to get closer in because of the way orbital mechanics works. But even if you could, um, the atmosphere of Venus is some kind of thick. Uh, and so, you know, how would you get rid of it if you could somehow... Uh, induce some sort of chemical reaction to remove most of the carbon dioxide from Venus's atmosphere, get it back into the rocks. Uh, not only would you be thinning the atmosphere out, but by removing that CO2, you'd be lowering the greenhouse effect and it would cool off. Um, but heck, if we could do that to Venus, we should probably try to do it here first. Um, you know, we, there's a lot more CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere than there was 100 years ago. And that's why we're, we're having climate change, because it's getting warmer. 
there are technologies that people are working on to um, extract the CO2 from the air and get it um, uh, mineralized, turn it into rock. I mean, it, it, you don't get like a rock made of CO2. It's, it's mixed in with other stuff. Um, it's an interesting technology, but right now it's in its infancy and it's very expensive to do. Uh, excuse me, it is very expensive to do. Um, so, you know, maybe someday if we figure out how to do it here on Earth, uh, we can move it to Venus, but uh, it's going to be a much larger project because, boy, Venus has a lot of atmosphere. All right, well, I think we have one more question that would be great to end on. So what excites you that is upcoming when it comes to observing and studying exoplanets? Oh, golly. Um, a lot of stuff. Um, we're starting to characterize their atmospheres. That's a whole thing I couldn't even talk about here. But as the planet um, passes in front of the star, the planet blocks the starlight. That's why we see the dip in the starlight. But some of the starlight passes through the atmosphere of that planet, if it has an atmosphere. And you can measure that. You can use that to figure out what's in the planet's atmosphere. This is super hard to do, um, but it is possible. And that's, it's being done to some extent. Um, so learning about their atmospheres um, is important because that helps us understand how these planets are made. A lot of these planets were... were uh, when they formed, it was under different circumstances than the planets in our solar system, especially if the star is very different. Um, another thing that's interesting, and I don't know, it's one of these things which is like, it's super cool, but I don't know what, it's, what we're really going to learn from it, uh, is the discovery of exomoons, moons orbiting these planets. We are on the thin, hairy edge of, of being able to discover moons orbiting these planets using, again, the transit method. In fact, um, I've written about this. There is a, a planet... Uh, a, a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting a star that may have a Neptune-sized moon orbiting it. it. It turns out when you look at the, the way the planet is blocking the star light, there's this extra little thing in there blocking light. And it looks like a Neptune-sized thing, um, but it would have to be orbiting this Jupiter-sized planet. And that doesn't make sense. How does that work? It, it, but it, a lot of things we're discovering about exoplanets is surprising, things you wouldn't necessarily predict it. Every planet except for Mercury and Venus in the solar system has a moon. Uh, in fact, you know, Jupiter has like 80 and may have hundreds. Uh, and so these big planets forming moons around them seems almost inevitable. So finding exomoons, it's kind of like, well, yeah, sure, of course they're gonna have moons. Um, but under different circumstances, it might, they might have bigger moons. What if you have a gas giant with an Earth-sized moon orbiting a star uh, in the habitable zone? So maybe the gas giant is uninhabitable, but the moon might be on the surface. So you don't have to worry about like Europa and Enceladus and getting into these dark oceans under the surface. You might have an Earth-like planet orbiting a gas giant. It's unlikely and there's all these problems, whatever. But the fact of the matter is we could start finding things like that uh, in the next few years as our telescopes and techniques get better. That I think would be extremely cool. That's a good one to end on. So thank you, Phil. We appreciate you coming out here tonight. And um, yeah, there's all sorts of great comments and, uh, and love in the Q&A and the chat here. So hope you have a chance to take a look at that too. I will. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm going to hand it back off to our president, Richard Wright, to close things off here and move on. Thanks. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Phil. That was a really great talk. And um, thank you, Frank and Sharife, for uh, proctoring the questions and, and answers. Um, Okay, so uh, in continuing with our regular club meeting, we just, uh, every, every month we have a main program, main speaker, but we also have a couple of mini programs uh, by our members. Uh, and our, uh, we have three mini programs uh, this week uh, that we'll be wrapping up. First up on is John Pinto. I don't know if John realized he was next. If not, we can, we can circle back around. John, are you... I am ready. Are you ready to go? Okay, then I'll just um, I'll just sort of fade into the background and let you run for a little bit. Let's get this up here. Get this started. All right. Welcome everybody. Um, this is going to be another calculation mini program which you may or may not be interested in, but uh, I hope you are. We're going to be calculating the minima of the variable star Algol. Now, I have to just put a little context as to why I thought this might be interesting. Um, some of us recently received the um, observing guide, observing handbook uh, from the uh, 
Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And so I was leafing through it and in it every month it prints the dates that Algol will have a minimum. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. And it also gives a little calculation on how you can do it yourself. So I ran the calculation. I said, hmm, these don't match up with the actual dates and times that are in the book. So, so I contacted them and they said, oh, no, no, it's got to be right. So one of our members, who's a, a, a avid variable star observer, Barbara Harris, uh, helped me to look in the uh, AABSO, which is a variable star organization here for the United States, um, and see what their calculation is. And sure enough, their calculation is totally different, but it does match up exactly to what is in the handbook's monthly guide. Great. So the next thing I checked was Sky and Telescope. You would think, uh, they got to be right on, right there, professional organization. So I go and look there, and sure enough, their calculations don't match the AABSO, and I've actually contacted them as well. So through all of that, that made me think this might be just an interesting thing because only because I had to go figure out how to do this, uh, that you might all be interested. So let's get going. So again, as I did last uh, month, um, I'm, I do this paper and pencil, pen, a couple of calculators, um, and uh, let's see how, how hard this is to do. So again, we'll make some assumptions that this is a calculation. So math phobic, I understand if you're gonna uh, mute me or hide your eyes and we'll come back later. Uh, there are a couple of things that you do need to be familiar with. Um, again, this isn't a uh, intro to astronomy program, but uh, just a few things I'll mention. So obviously you need to know what a variable star is. It's a star whose brightness magnitude varies. Uh, magnitude. Uh, Algol is in the constellation Perseus. So if you wanted to observe this, you will need to pull out your star chart, your, your star app to find it. Perseus right now is, uh, is, is a nice constellation to, to view this time of year. Uh, I'm be talking about coordinated universal time. That's how astronomers keep track of time. Julian day numbers and other important uh, thing to understand when you're doing any kind of astronomical calculation. And again, I'm going to present this from the point of view of an observer in Florida because it simplifies some of the calculations. So what actually is the minima of Algol? First of all, you should know Algol is probably the most famous of the variable stars. It was probably the first one ever observed. Uh, I believe even in uh, Greek and maybe even Babylonian times, they had noticed this. <clears throat> Again, I said it resides in the constellation of Perseus. It, uh, the minima is when Algol is at its dim dimmest magnitude of 3.4 from its normal magnitude of 2.1. So this is fairly obvious um, to, to observe. Algol will remain near its minimum magnitude for about an hour before and an hour after the actual calculated minima. So this means we don't have to be super accurate in our calculation, um, just as long as you're you know, somewhere in a, that two hour fra framework, you will be fine. So again, as I mentioned, our calculation is going to be based on the current AAVSO formula, which does change from time to time. Um, as they observe Algol and they see that uh, the time of the minima is changing, they do update the formula. So if you are observing Algol and you notice that the minima is not quite lining up, check the AAVSO website for any updates to the formula. And this is a quick finder chart for Algol. So Algol is over here. I'm not sure if you could see my, my pointer. And these other stars are stars to compare its brightness to. So normally Algol is about the brightness of gamma and Andromeda. Uh, but when it dims, it's going to get dimmer than Epsilon Perseus, Persei, but probably not as dim as Kappa Persei. So it starts off here, 
gets a little dimmer than here. And somewhere between this epsilon and kappa is where algal will end up when it's at minima. So that's basically how you observe it. So how are we gonna do the calculation? This is a little bit more complicated than doing the equinox and solstice calculations that we did last month, uh, but not too much difficult, not too much different. So we're gonna start, instead of doing this kind of at the end, we're gonna do this at the beginning. We're going to calculate the Julian day number of the month we're interested in observing algal. So we're gonna do February. We have to determine something called the current E for that month. And we'll see where that comes in. Once we can do that, we can actually determine the first minima of the month. We'll convert that to universal uh, time, coordinated universal time. We'll convert that to local Florida time. And then just knowing that first minima for the month, we can actually calculate fairly easily the rest of the minima for the month. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, just as an aside, you won't see this uh, Perseus here in Florida every night of the year. Uh, Algo does, and Perseus does go below the horizon. Uh, it's not circumpolar for us. So I took a look at my planisphere and I checked it out. And basically, in evening from sunset to midnight, Perseus is visible to us September through April. So basically winter. If you happen to like observing in the early morning, it's visible from May through January, you know, more like summertime into the fall. And of course, this is all approximate as it depends on when the sun is setting and rising. If you want to check the AAVSO website for the formula, the current formula, you go into this thing called the um, variable star index, type in algol, and you look for this page, and you're gonna look for two things. One is something called the epoch, and something called the period. Those two numbers you're gonna see show up in our calculation. So if the formula changes, those are the numbers that you would, you would update. All right, so let's get going. We're going to calculate the JD for the year and month we're interested in. <clears throat> so again, as last time, we have many options to calculate this. We could go to a JD calendar on the AVSO website. You can print one out for the year, hang it up on your wall. They have a calculator at the same site, and you can actually just type in the date and get the JD. Or you can calculate it manually, which is what we are going to do. That's what the calculator looks like. You put in a date and time, and it'll calculate the GD for you. All right, as we did last month, we're gonna start off with just calculating it for the year. So to calculate JD for the beginning of the year, you take this number, 17214945, and you add it to the truncated value of 365 and a quarter, that should look familiar, times year minus one. So I'm going to do it for 2021. And that turns out to be, again, that number plus 365 and a quarter times 221 minus one. That's 2020. You do that multiplication and you get 737,805 days. There is no fractional portion, so truncating it is fairly simple. And then you add those two numbers together. And there you have the JD for the beginning of the year. As I mentioned in the uh, solstice calculation back in December, you only need to do this once a year. Keep this number in your notebook and you'll never have to do this calculation until next year. Now we just need to find out the beginning of the month. You just take that JD for the beginning of the year we calculated and add something called the days into the year for the month. In the appendix to this um, presentation, I put a DIY table for every month of the year. And it really only depends on whether it's a leap year or not. 
So you just look it up and you add it. Again, 221. It's a normal year, so don't have to worry about leap years. Month is February. You look it up in the table, and it will say the days into the year for February, the beginning of February is 31. Add that to our starting number for the year, and the beginning of February's JD is 2459245.5. Okay, with that, we are ready to calculate this thing called the E for the month. Now, just so you know, I have no idea why it's called the E, but it just seems to be the, uh, the standard way of uh, determining this. So here's how you do it. <clears throat> Your JD minima, right, when does algol have a minima, is always, for now, this number, which was, you'll see in that slide earlier, if you go back, uh, was the epoch. And then this was the period, 2.86736, from that same slide, time this mysterious number called E. So we need to calculate that E. So what we do is we are gonna calculate the uh, JD for the beginning of the month that we calculated before. And we're gonna subtract the epoch value. We're gonna call that D. I just made that up. Once we find that number, we divide that by the period, truncate it, and add one. And that is what we're gonna call the E for the beginning of the month. So again, let's do our February example. That was the uh, JD for the beginning of February. We subtract out the epoch and we get 306, 3.66. And we do the quick calculation. Divide 306, 3.66 divided by 2.8736, we get 1068.46. We truncate that to just 1068, add one to it, and it's 10, E is 1069 for February, 2021. Why is that important? That's the next slide. That is what we need to calculate the first minima of February. This is actually fairly straightforward. The first minima will be our epoch plus the period times the E we just calculated. So again, here we go. February, epoch, period, our E was 1069. That comes out to 3065.20784. Hit those two numbers together. And here we go. That is the first minima of February 2021. It's JD, I should say. We just need to convert that to coordinated universal time and local uh, clock time, Florida time, and we are almost there. So the UTC we know is in the month of February. So this part is gonna be really simple. We just have to calculate the date and time within February. To do that, you take that first minima, you subtract out the JD for the beginning of February, which we had calculated earlier. For example, February, that was the first minima we calculated. That was the beginning of the month that we calculated and we get that it was February 1st, 0.54784. Now we just convert that to Florida time. To do that, we, we, we subtract out the time zone factor. So it depends on whether we're on standard time or daylight savings time. February is standard time. So, <clears throat> we're going to be using 2.08333. Subtract that from our UTC, and that's when it will be the first minima in Florida, February 1st, 0.33951. Of course, we don't have clocks that work on fractions of a day, so we need to convert that to our standard 24-hour clock. Um, this should be pretty obvious how to do this. I'm not going to go into a lot of explanation, but I'll just run through this real quick. For February, 
we took that LCT and we truncate it and that gives you our day. So it's February 1st. We subtract out the day to get the fraction of a day. And we multiply by 24 to get the fractional hour. We truncate that and that gives us that it's at 8 a.m. We subtract that out to get the, there's a mistake there, that should be minus eight. Uh, and that would be 0 0.14816 fractional minutes in the eighth hour. We round that off and it comes out to nine minutes. So February 1st, 8.09 a.m. That is our first minima for February. Now we just have to do the rest for the month. And I just checked the high accuracy calculation from the handbook and it turns out to be, that is correct. It's February 1st, 8 or 9 a.m. So we did our calculations correctly. So here's how I'm gonna calculate the minimum for the rest of the month. I noticed that the period is 2.86736 days. I converted that to hours and minutes. That's two days, 20 hours and 49 minutes. That's almost three days. So the way I'm doing it is I'm adding three days to each minimum, and I'm gonna subtract three hours and 11 minutes to get the next minimum. Obviously, if we're crossing between standard time and daylight savings time, just be careful. You may have to add or subtract an hour. So starting on February 1st at 8 or 9 a.m., the next minimum adding three days is February 4th. Subtracting three hours and 11 minutes gives me 4.58 a.m. Three more days, February 7th, subtracting three hours and 11 minutes, I get 1.47 a.m. And so forth and so on for each of the rest of the days in February. Now this is, <clears throat> the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is figure out which of these are times when you think you might actually be able to observe algal. Obviously, you could get up at 4.58 a.m. or 1.47 a.m. and take a look at it, uh, but I don't recommend it because at that time, either Perseus is gonna be really low in the sky in February or not visible at all. Obviously, you can't go at 8, 8, 9 a.m. because the sun's out, so you're not gonna see any stars. So for February, as I analyzed all of these dates and times, <clears throat> It looked like February 9th and February 12th are going to be good times to observe the minima of algal. Um, I recommend since it at, is that minimum an hour before or an hour after that to actually start observing it maybe three or four hours before so you kind of see what it looks like at its full brightness, full magnitude, and then go out every 15, 20 minutes, every half an hour, and then observe it and see the progression of the minima come in and then observe every 15, 20, 30 minutes afterwards and you'll see it go back to its original brightness. So that's actually a really cool thing to observe uh, throughout, the, uh, through that, throughout the evening as you're doing your other observing. Uh, I promised all the other DIY values for the year. So that's this little table here. And as I said last time, if you want to learn more of how to do all of this on your own, there's a couple of very good uh, options for you. This is probably the, what I'll call the easier guide, the gentle introduction to doing this. Uh, if you get, whet your appetite and you want to go up in difficulty, this would be what I would suggest as the next step up. Of course, if you're really dedicated, you'll want the handbook, or if you are going to become a professional, this is the uh, the reference. That's the end for now. Uh, we'll be back in the future with other uh, similar type programs. Uh, I will post this slide deck to Groups IO and Facebook so that um, you can go through this on your own, take your time, and uh, calculate this on yourself anytime you feel like. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, if uh, anybody's got some. Yep. Thank you, John. Uh, this is a good time to make an appeal to our membership. 
Um, it is an astronomical society. Uh, we have a lot of amateur astronomers. Uh, if you have an observing program or you're into uh, computational pro uh, astronomy even uh, that you, know, you are uh, engaged in and you'd like to share with the members, uh, we'd love to, uh, to find out what uh, some of our members are doing uh, along those lines. Uh, contact um, uh, uh, Trisha, who's our vice president in charge of programs, uh, or really you could contact anybody on the board uh, to let us know that, uh, that you're interested, and we'll give you a little slot uh, so you can talk about uh, what it is you're uh, working on. So our next mini program is uh, going to be, uh, Derek Demeter is going to be up with our member astrophotos and sketches. We have a number of talented astrophotographers and uh, people who do sketching in the club, and every month uh, we like to uh, show those off so the other members can see what uh, other people are doing. See, sort of the same idea, right? Uh, it's an active club. We're all doing different things. And the uh, sketching and astrophotography is uh, of wide interest, so uh, we like to show that. So I'm going to just turn that over to you, Derek. All right. Thank you, Richard. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go through some of our various images that have been taken this past uh, month. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm looking right now and I believe we do have some individuals here uh, that have submitted their photos and I have the ability to turn on um, uh, audio uh, for those um, individuals that want to speak. So I'm going to go through the different photos and I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump over to the participants pay, uh column here and if you're interested and you want to chat a little bit about your your objects that you've submitted um, you can go ahead and do that as well so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, just like usually with our um, astro photographs we kind of start near the earth and we work our way out so we're going to go ahead and get to our first image and this actually comes from uh, uh, Robert Russo. I believe you're, you're actually here, Robert. So I, I, I allowed you to sp uh, talk. If you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself um, and just mention a little bit about this image here. Okay, this was uh, taken with a 180 millimeter Mac. Uh, it's a um, merge of three separate images. Each image is 10,000 frames using the best 5% uh, taken with a ZWO 462 camera on a really simple alt as used mount. Basically, I did a lot of lunar photography this month kind of to encourage those of us that don't have the high-end stuff just to get out there and use what we have. Absolutely. And uh, I'm actually, I believe the next image is yours as well, uh, Robert, real quick. But before you do that, I want to mention, and of course, uh, Richard will be doing a program on the moon in a little bit, that the moon is one of the best objects to observe in the sky because like uh, Robert said, you don't need a huge telescope. You don't need a fancy setup. And it is a m wonderful uh, object that no matter what your sky conditions are. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to this image. And um, boy, you know, I was just zooming around. I think that's, is that, that's Kepler, I think I got. Um, but it looks like it, yes. Same concept, 10,000. I found that with my camera, 10,000 frames and using the best 5 or 10% was the best. Um, that 462 camera works great. It's got 2.9 micron pixels, and I image at about F17, so it's a really good match. Um, again, alt as mount, uh, nothing special, just a lot of fun. Excellent. And uh, I think this is your final moon picture that you submitted, I believe. Yep. Same, same concept. Just uh, get out there, point it, and uh, half the fun is just moving around the moon and finding cool objects and then getting a lunar atlas and trying to figure out what you just took a picture of. All right. Excellent. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you, mute you for now, but we'll, you'll be back in a little bit later, Robert, because I think you um, had an image of the Orion Nebula that I will I will show in a little bit. All right, excellent. So some great lunar pictures. Um, the next, um, let me see if he's in here. Yes. Um, so Mauricio, I believe you're also going to be in here as well. So I'll be unmuting you if you're interested in chatting a little about your image. But uh, for those that were uh, aware, back in December 21st, 
um, of last year, we had a very awesome and rare uh, moment where two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, were about 0.1 degrees in separation. And we had some several uh, photographs submitted. Uh, I believe the first one here is Frank Kane's submission. So Frank, if you uh, don't mind sharing a little bit about this image that you've taken. Yeah, this is the great conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And this was a stack of only about a thousand frames only. That's, uh, that's actually not a lot when it comes to planetary imaging. Uh, but yeah, this is just a single exposure. I did boost the brightness of Saturn just a wee bit to make it a little bit uh, prettier. Uh, but you can barely make out there. I think it's Titan there uh, next to Saturn and three moons of Jupiter at least. Um, but yeah, that's how it looked through the uh, eyepiece of the Celestron 11-inch Edge HD with a uh, ASI 224MC camera attached and a focal reducer so I could actually fit it onto the chip of the imaging uh, camera there. All right, yeah, th that's a great image, uh, Frank. All right, our next image uh, comes from Mauricio. Um, this is his image of the conjunction. Uh, Mauricio, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Um, if you wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, this image you've taken. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, so uh, this was taken through um, the a Celestron 8SE uh, with the Canon Rebel looking through the telescope and it's just one frame uh, taken in camera raw. And then um, I had to do the same as Frank. I had to uh, boost the exposure uh, in Photoshop on Saturn just so you could see something. Um, and yeah, I was actually I was actually amazed at some of the amazing pictures other people took just because of how low these were in the sky. I didn't think anybody would be able to get amazing photos. So there's just been some really great pictures. Whoops. Excellent hit. Yes, absolutely. And and this is a this is amazing with the, for a one one uh, frame. Now, did you do you have a camera that you used um, in a telescope that you've you've taken this with? Um, yeah. So uh, so the uh, the Canon Rebel T three. Um, I just use a T ring adapter, put it right through the uh, you know through the eyepiece, and and that's how I I snapped it. I also took a few with. Um, my uh, XYZ cell phone adapter to see just, you know, what kind of photos you could do with this one. I actually did, I was able to capture uh, both the planets using a cell phone, but the picture from the Canon Rebel was uh, much better. So I, I shared that one instead. Excellent. No, it, it, came, it came out great. And especially again, for a single image that, uh, that, that details and, and, and the location. Yeah, we were battling uh, quite a low object and, and the skies were not 100% uh, super clear um, uh, during that night as well. Um, so thank you, Mauricio, uh, for that, um, that yeah. image there. Um, all right, excellent. So uh, we're going to go ahead and make our way to the next image. This is a, an image that I took. Um, it was actually several different images. Um, and I have some labels here for you all just, uh, just to see. Um, I was actually uh, during our event um, during the uh, Mars, it, or geez, uh, our Jupiter Saturn conjunction event. Um, I was snapping some of these while uh, Frank was um, chatting. Um, uh, and also our, our one of our speakers, Ken Brandt, was chatting. I got a chance to get some images. Unfortunately, I kind of lost it about uh, around 6 o'clock. So these were images that were taken before. Uh, it was truly astronomical twilight, but um, I was able to capture uh, Jupiter. I was able to capture the moons and uh, Saturn and its moons as well. So this is actually um, four separate images, actually. Uh, with several thousand frames each. This is, was taken with a CPC 800, so an eight inch Schmidt uh, using a ZWO 174 uh, camera. And again, four separate images, one exposure of Jupiter itself, another exposure of Jupiter's moons, then another exposure of Saturn, and then another exposure of Saturn's moons. And for Saturn's moons, I was only able to get maybe about uh, 300 frames um, because of just how long the exposure was and how little time I was able to get. But the nice thing about the moons is that you can kind of get away with uh, less frames because you're not necessarily focused on 
uh, all the detail that you get with the moons with, with Saturn and Jupiter. So, so yeah, and and again, as Mauricio mentioned, there were tons and tons and tons of great uh, astro uh, photography of this event. So definitely go out there and take a look at some of these uh, wonderful images taken during that uh, historic event. All right, our next image. Uh, this is back to uh, Robert. So. Um, you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and talk a little bit about uh, this object here. Uh, yeah, this was uh, actually one I enjoyed taking. This is again on an old as mount. Um, tried to do short exposures. Obviously, with an old alt as mount, you can't do long exposure due to field rotation. Uh, but I was still able to get 45 seconds. Um, I, I shoot. This is an 80 millimeter stellar view of about four. 50 um, focal length, so it's pretty it's pretty quick. Uh, but this is 113 stacked images, um, and with Orion, it actually comes out easier um, when you do shorter exposures, so you don't blow out the core too much, um, and I don't have to you know do HDR overlaps on uh, uh, with software. So it was actually fun. 113 images. Um, again, to show people that um, the mount I have that I use uh, is a AZ Pro. Uh, mount from Ioptron. I bought it used for 750 bucks. Um, tripod I had laying around. Uh, the Stellar View Refractor. Uh, it's one of the last uh, 80 accesses or access that Stellar View made, and I think I paid 600 bucks for it. Um, camera is an unmodded DLSR. It's a Canon T7i that I use for wildlife photography. So I have that, and the laptops. Everybody's got one. So I mean, you don't have to pour a lot of money in it to get a decent image. It's obviously not eye candy um, that you'd get with longer exposures, but I was, uh, I was pretty proud of how it came out. No, absolutely. Uh, um, and you, you did this from your back, from your house, right? <laughs> from my driveway. Um, yeah. I did use uh, uh, Astronomic CLS uh, clip-in filter, which is phenomenal. It made a huge difference with light pollution. Absolutely. We'll definitely have to maybe do a a program on these uh, these filters because I think it, there are some new exciting uh, filters for all different cameras that are really changing the game, for especially dealing with light pollution. And, um, you but, know, it's uh, something. It's, sorry, Danny, something to say for people of alt as too is remember that if you if you grab like the Orion Nebula when it's just coming up out in the east, your field rotation is actually pretty minimal as long as you keep it you know get it lower. Um, so it's all about just trying to take, take, take pictures in the east and west. Right. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, great detail in the trapezium and uh, surrounding areas. So thank you, Rob, uh, Robert, for, for that. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to our um, next, next picture. Actually, Frank, you have the next couple. You submitted quite a few. You've been on a roll uh, this month. Um, so we'll start with this one here. Yeah, finally some dark skies, yeah. So uh, this is the Co-Nebula, the Fox Fur Nebula, and the Christmas Tree Cluster, all in one shot there. Really pretty part of the sky. Uh, about 12-ish hours of exposure, if I remember right. Uh, this is actually HARGB, so it is true colors for the most part, uh, but enhanced with hydrogen alpha narrowband data as well to make it uh, a little bit more detailed than you get otherwise. You can kind of see some of that uh, blue reflection nebula up there on the... Uh, around that bright star on the top, which whose name eludes me at the moment. Uh, but yeah, this is the uh, same setup as usual, a uh, Mac Newto yeah, Maxutov Newtonian telescope, the Star Watcher 190MN with an ATIC 383L plus uh, cooled CCD camera and a Paramount MIT mount. Excellent, and uh, we'll move on to your next image. Ah, yes, looks like a goldfish to me, but this is actually the uh, the quote unquote head of the Seagull Nebula. I was kind of hoping to get the whole thing, but uh, just wouldn't fit in my field of view. So got this little part of it. Um, still a pretty little nebula. Same deal. I think this is about one night worth, worth of data. So more like eight hours of data. And uh, this is, I believe, uh, narrow band data exclusively. So uh, HA, um, sulfur, and oxygen data combined together and processed to make pretty. Same setup as before. All right. And then our next image here. Uh, yeah, I like this one. This is the Monkey Head Nebula. I think that's like in Orion, like up by uh, the top of it somewhere, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Yeah. 
uh, narrow band as well. Uh, this is almost the Hubble palette, a little bit of a twist on it, but you can kind of see that bluish oxygen in the middle and uh, more of the hydrogen around this object. And yeah, if you squint, kind of looks like a monkey. I think it was John Pinto who said it kind of looks like one of those Wizard of Oz, Oz monkeys, you know, the, the evil ones with the Wicked Witch of the West. But cool object and uh, same setup as before. All right. And then uh, I think that was it, actually. Yep. Yes. All right. So thank you, Frank. All right. And uh, this is uh, the Orion Nebula here as well. Um, this is an image I took over at the Geneva campus. Um, I was actually doing, I just purchased a new uh, 1000 watt a lithium ion battery thing called Jackery. It's actually a, uh, they had a sale. I think Denise Woody also mentioned it on a um, Cephas um, closed group post uh, about these, about this deal. Uh, got a chance to try it out. Wonderful. Um, was able to run everything and all night long, essentially. Uh, so I wanted to try it out before going to deeper, uh, darker skies. I got a chance to go out. I'm actually processing one of my images. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you that um, next month. Um, but anyway, so the Orion Nebula, there's not much, you know, we, we talked about that earlier. Uh, this is with a basically the same scope that Frank uses, only uh, Orion telescopes and not Skywatcher. It's the 190 millimeter Mag Magzatov Newtonian. Uh, I'm using a cooled Canon 6D modified camera. So basically what that means is they took the chip from the 6D put it into a cooling box. And so essentially it's effectively a one shot color um, cooled camera, uh, but still has the uh, actual camera body attached to it. So you can actually run it as a camera because I use it also for uh, nightscapes and stuff like that. Um, and uh, this was uh, about a couple, about uh, two hours worth of data um, on the Orion Nebula. And uh, this, the, the exposures are about three minutes each uh, and using a uh, software BIS Mighty Mount as well. So, um, so yeah, so uh, our next image, I, oh, that's where I, was. I realized, Frank, you had another image in here. And I just realized because we got to go beyond our Milky Way. So you have the final image of the night. So uh, there you are. Yeah, we're like uh, just beyond the Milky Way and far beyond it as well in this image. So uh, this is M81, Bode's Galaxy. And every year I take a picture of this and try to do it a little bit better. And what's different this year is the IFN, the Integrated Reflection Nebula. Uh, no, sorry, Integrated Flux Nebula. I got that right that time. It's a uh, cloud of gas that's just outside the Milky Way. And that's kind of what that blotchy background is that you see in the picture here. It's not noise, that's really gas. That's outside of our galaxy, which is pretty cool. And beyond that gas is Bose Galaxy M81. Uh, and yeah, this is just like one night's worth of data which is kind of awesome. So it kind of shows you um, what going up a couple of Bortle numbers can do. So um, if I try to do this in winter springs, it just would not happen. But uh, in one night out here in North Merritt Island, I was able to uh, get a better image than I could in a week out there. So down with light pollution guys, dark skies make a difference. Absolutely. So yeah, so there we have it. There are all the images uh, for this month. And uh, please submit your images to not only me, but also to the Sharifa as well. She's happy to promote those um, on the Cephas social channels. But uh, uh, clear skies to you all. Hopefully, I think this Saturday we're expected to have, it's supposed to be cold, but clear. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we get to see some of you out there. I know I'm going to be out there uh, again. Um, and uh, hopefully get to see some more images from all of you. Yeah, it's nice to get some good weather finally. Uh, for everything. Also, don't forget if you sketch, uh, send us your sketches too. Um, sketches are, are also great. So we're going to wrap up tonight with, uh, I have one final mini program, which is not very long. After all this talk about um, deep sky stuff, I like to talk, I like to spend just if you'll allow me just a minute uh, on the moon. And today we're gonna talk about the uh, full moon glories or rays and ejecta on the moon. Uh, the full moon is the best time to observe and study many features that stand out best when the sun is nearly overhead, uh, particularly some impact uh, craters exhibit vivid ray and ejecta features. Ray and ejecta is just a fancy way, all that stuff that got blown out of the ground when the original impactor uh, hit the moon. The king of all ray and ejecta systems is Tycho, 
or Tico, depending on your accent. I've heard it said both ways. I'm not sure authoritatively which way it is. I prefer Tycho, but I may be completely wrong. Located in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the crater itself is only a little more than 50 miles across, but the rays extend for hundreds of miles out from the crater in all directions. Here's a close up view uh, of, of the area. In this high contrast image, you can see blankets of bright aluminum rich material being blown out from the impact. Uh, amazingly, these features are more like a light coating of snow on the lunar surface rather than heaps of uh, snow banks in all directions. So physically, uh, these rays have almost no impact on uh, the elevation. It, it's more like just a dusting in all of these directions away from, uh, away from the central crater. The next uh, two most prominent areas of ray and ejecta systems are from the craters uh, Kepler and Copernicus. Uh, these are more along the middle latitudes. And here's another high contrast uh, image. Now I process these uh, I, in black and white and, uh, and kind of tweak the contrast a little bit so that you could see these uh, a little bit better. You can see these naked eye uh, through, well, not naked eye, but through a telescope as well. But a camera and a monitor cannot reproduce the what we call the dynamic range of what you see in the eyepiece. So the only way to do that is sort of to push the image a little bit uh, so we can present it on a computer monitor. Uh, these two uh, craters have uh, beautiful uh, patterns around them. Just, uh, you know, bug goes splat, uh, if you will. And they overlap each other and they make very intricate and beautiful wispy little patterns uh, going over each other. These features are also very young in comparison to other lunar, tra uh, lunar terrain. Over millions of years, um, the sun's radiation shining down on these will, will darken them and they'll become dark like some of the other uh, material around them. Our next stop is called uh, Bur Burgius A on the western side of the moon. Uh, Burgius is actually a large crater. Let me get my mouse over here. Right about here, it's actually the same size as Tycho, but smaller craters around big ones get named by, after the big crater with a, with a letter after them. So this is Burgess A, which is actually a very small crater. This is only about 11 miles across, but you can see how bright that is. That's all fresh material uh, that's been kicked up and hasn't been darkened uh, by the sun yet. And so this is actually how we can tell uh, how old uh, features are. One feature that overlaps another is obviously uh, much younger, and these brighter features haven't, ha haven't been darkened yet uh, by the passage of time. Our last stop is gonna be the crater Aristarchus, which is northwest of the crater, uh, well, actually uh, northwest of both uh, Kepler and Copernicus here in the middle. And Aristarchus is also relatively young and very bright. Uh, the crater itself is only 25 miles wide, and it's one of the brightest features on the moon, and it's an amazing feature to observe uh, anytime that it's illuminated, whether the sun's right overhead or coming from the east or coming from the west. This big long finger you see here is actually from uh, a crater, uh, Gushko, uh, which is out of frame and to the lower left. So this is our lunar challenge this month, actually is going to be uh, Aristarchus and its companion Herodotus. And there's, there's Herodotus right there. Um, so look at it. Sketch it, take pictures of it, that's your challenge. There's a lot of interesting stuff around Aristarchus. In fact, if you follow any of the lunar observing programs, um, the, most, uh, the most reported area with uh, lunar transit phenomena or things going on that could be going on on the surface are in the Aristarchus area. And that could mean that it's very active. Uh, most likely it means that it's just one of the most interesting areas on the moon and there's always a lot of people looking at it uh, who think they see something. Uh, but we'll talk more about Aristarchus and Herodotus in detail next month uh, when we do another Minute on the Moon. And that's all I got. End of show. All right. Stop share. Okay, so that actually concludes our uh, meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society for January 2021. I hope all of our members are well and staying safe and, um, and looking up in the sky. Our next meeting, let me double check before I blurt something out. Yes, February the 10th, uh, same bat time, same bat channel uh, on Zoom, seven o'clock. Uh, and I hope to see a lot of you there. Uh, and until then, uh, everybody have a great month and um, keep your chin up. <laughs> Bye.
That's it. We're done.